afternoon. Um, before I really dive into the, the subject at the hand, I'd like to just say a few, a few brief words about a bit more about Benjamin Franklin House and also about the education program. Um, so in case you haven't visited Benjamin Franklin House before, we are a grade one listed Georgian townhouse, which you can find right in the center of London, tucked away on Craven Street, which is round the corner from Trafalgar Square. Um, and uh, we hope that when we reopen, you'll be able to come and visit us soon. So my role at the house is to take care of the education provision. And we have weekly education days um, where schools come to visit and also families come to learn with us at the house as well. Every year we serve around 3,000 school pupils free of charge. That's through these visits and also through outreach workshops in schools and large scale education events. Although the house is currently closed, uh, we are continuing to provide that educational support um, through online resources. And these include weekly virtual classes, which we're holding on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. If you'd like to find out any more about our education program um, or even give a donation to help support us continue this work in these uncertain times, please do visit our website. So to come to the um, topic at hand, um, what with my background in education, uh, particularly primary education, I have a real interest in these formative years of, of Benjamin Franklin's and, and how they shaped the really uh, brilliant and incredibly influential man that he, he went on to be. So most of the in-depth studies of Benjamin Franklin's life tend to focus on his later years, particularly his involvement in the American Revolution which of course is understandable given this was such a, a historic, significant historic event. Um, this may also be because there's a much greater amount of uh, source material as we get later into his life and he's regained fame and, and notoriety. Um, and this focus on Benjamin Franklin's later years is also reflected in the, um, the artistic representations of him that we're familiar with. Perhaps the one that's most um, familiar is the one that's featured on the $100 bill. But the image you see on the screen, or should see on the screen um, currently, is, is showing Franklin as a younger man. So um, this portrait is by Robert Freck, and it was painted in circa 1746. It's currently at the Harvard University Portrait Collection. And at this point, Franklin was 40 years old. He was soon going to retire from his successful printing business, uh, through which he'd made his fortune. And then he was going to be able to go on and do um, his, lots of his scientific work and his influential politics as well. But in this talk, I'm not going to take us quite up to the point at which we see um, Franklin in this portrait. I'm going to focus, focus really on the very early part of his life, so from his birth in 1706 up until 1729, when he was 23. Um, so the reason I, I chose this point to as, as a cutoff uh, was firstly in the interest of keeping to time, um, because there's really a lot to say about all the stages of Franklin's life. Um, but also because I think by this stage, um, we'll see that a lot of the most important seeds have already been sown um, that are going to determine his, his future trajectory. So during this talk, I'm going to be drawing a lot on Franklin's own autobiography, um, which is really the principal source material that we have for this part of his life. Um, and we do need to approach it with caution. He started writing the autobiography when he was 65 years old, so looking, looking back at his life. And I think it's fair to say that he was doing that with um, somewhat of an editor's eye. So it's important to, to, to have some caution when we, when, we, when we see what he says about himself. Um, so I'm also going to be drawing on, on quite a recent research done by um, historian and writer Nick Butler um, and his book, Young Benjamin Franklin, The Birth of Ingenuity, was published in 2018. And in it, he really set out to um, fill in any gaps and, and inconsistencies which we might find in, in the autobiography. So if uh, you uh, enjoy uh, today's talk and you want to delve a bit deeper into these, uh, this early part of Franklin's life, then, then I'd encourage you, you to start with, with that study. So um, let's start the story at the beginning of Benjamin Franklin's story. Um, in fact, let's start a little before the beginning uh, with his ancestors. So uh, a prologue of sorts, if you will. So on the screen now, you, can, you should be able to see three images. 
On the left, there's an impression of um, the home of Franklin's paternal grandfather, who was called Thomas Franklin. And um, the Franklins had lived for generations in uh, an area of Northamptonshire called Ecton. And indeed, when Benjamin Franklin came to live at 36 Craven Street, he arrived in 1757 and, and not long after that, in 1758, he, um, together with his son William, went to visit um, this ancestral, in search of this ancestral home and also the, um, the graves of his forebearers too. Um, so that, unfortunately, there aren't known portraits of Franklin's father, so his name was Josiah. Um, but in the middle of the screen, we have um, what's believed to be a portrait of um, Franklin's mother, a buyer, and her maiden name was Folger. And on the right, we have the Folger um, family tree. Now, um, a buyer was born in Nantucket, and this um, quite beautiful family tree was um, created by one of her descendants in 1866. So as we are all our parents' children, I thought it was important to um, spend a bit of time telling you a bit more about Franklin's parents. So let's start with his father's side. Um, I've spoken a little bit already about where, where they were based in the country. And um, on this side, Franklin was really descended from a very rich heritage of skilled craftsmen. So Thomas, his grandfather, was a blacksmith. And um, he sent four of his sons to do um, apprenticeships in London, including Benjamin's father, Josiah, um, who went and completed a seven year apprenticeship um, to become a silk dyer. Um, and I think that uh, Nick Butler in his book, Young Benjamin Franklin, talks about this very interestingly. Um, I think it's often there's a, there's a, a conception that Franklin has this real rags to riches story, which is partly influenced by Franklin himself in his um, autobiography. And um, Nick Bowen Bunker challenges that somewhat um, in explaining that actually um, to be a silk dyer, that was a very highly skilled position and, and very well paid as well, or quite well paid. Um, and so that perhaps it wasn't quite so rags to riches as Benjamin Franklin might have had us believe. Also, it was incredibly technical, this work, and um, almost akin to experimental um, chemistry. So we may even see in, in his father's original profession some of the um, origins of Franklin's interest in, in science, which would, which would become a huge part of his life later on. So um, Josiah, uh, after his time in London, Josiah lived briefly in Oxford where, um, and he was married to his first wife, Anne. Uh, they were both Presbyterians and at the time, so by this point we're in the 1680s, um, they were one of the groups that were targeted as opponents by um, Charles II after his return to the throne. So since it wasn't a particularly hospitable environment um, in the 1680s for Franklin's father and um, his first wife, they decided to emigrate to the colonies. So they left in 1683 and they arrived in Boston in October. Unfortunately, there were no silk dyeing jobs to be had in Boston. So um, it's true that, um, or we could say that uh, Josiah had to take a bit of a social step down when he arrived in, in Boston, and or perhaps a step sideways. He, he looked for another um, craft and he um, took up the work of being a tallow chandler. So originally making, um, making candles and then later soap as well. So this was really quite, quite grueling work and um, not still very highly skilled, but not as well paid as it had been for um, the silk dyeing. And so then became, began this long process of kind of rebuilding his stature and um, supporting his family. So after their arrival in Boston, a few years later in 1689, um, unfortunately Anne died in childbirth. And after this, that's when Josiah um, met and married Benjamin Franklin's mother, Abiah. Now, Abiah um, was the daughter of Peter Folger, um, uh, who was a Puritan and one of the first settlers in New England. And he worked as a surveyor, uh, also did some teaching and wrote poetry. So um, on, in, his, on his, in his maternal line, perhaps we can see that there was some of this aptitude for writing, which um, Benjamin Franklin would definitely go on to show, um, well, really from his early years onwards. So um, Franklin does speak fondly of both his parents in his autobiography. He um, comments on their excellent constitution. Indeed, they both lived into their 90s, as did Franklin himself. And he describes uh, his father as ingenious, 
and his mother as um, discreet and virtuous, which may appear rather gendered to the modern eye, but I think uh, was meant, in, um, meant affectionately at the time. So having examined Benjamin Franklin's forebearers, let's come now to his childhood um, in Boston. So on the left of your screen, you should be able to see an image of Boston. It's actually from a slightly later period in 1801, but the, the building, the old state house that you can see in the, in the center of the image, that was built um, soon after Franklin was born. It was built in 1713. So Benjamin Franklin was born on the 17th of January, 1706. And um, Josiah's first wife, Anne, had given birth to seven children, although sadly two of them died in childbirth. And then Abiah would go on to give birth to 10 children. So Benjamin Franklin grew up in a big family and he was the youngest son. They lived on a clapboard house at um, 17 Milk Street in Boston. Uh, unfortunately, the house is no longer there. Uh, in, in fact, Benjamin Franklin House um, in London is the only residence that Franklin lived in that's still standing today. So in his autobiography, Benjamin Franklin um, is slightly critical of this house. He describes it as a lowly dwelling, um, but his account of his childhood um, it is, is very happy by all accounts. And although um, his family were numerous, it doesn't seem that they, they were really lacking of anything. Um, now, in terms of schooling, uh, Franklin did go to school, but only for two years. And he actually went to two different schools. And um, all of this formal education, the decisions that were made there, um, it was his father Josiah that was really making those decisions and it was all determined um, by job prospects. So originally at the age of eight, Franklin was sent to the Latin school because he was intend it was intended that he would join the clergy, um, which really he wasn't suited with for. So um, it's maybe lucky that we, his path changed. Um, but the reason it changed really was partly because it was expensive and also um, Josiah could see that there actually weren't great um, job opportunities for clergymen in New England at that time. Um, so after the, the Latin school, um, if Franklin had continued down that path, he would have had to go to Harvard. And then there were a, almost a, a sur surplus of um, clergymen that were being, being turned out of Harvard. So there was, weren't enough jobs for them at that time. So after that, he went and completed another year of schooling, this time at the writing school. And there he was being prepared much for, more for commerce and trade. So um, carrying on that, that lineage of um, craftsmanship that we've seen in his, in his father's line. Um, so although Benjamin Franklin had limited formal schooling, he was a, a great lover of reading and was an autodidact and continued to learn really throughout his life. Um, in these early years, he also developed an interest in health and exercise, and this interest overlapped with some of his earliest um, innovations. So that's why we have this image on, on the right of the screen. Um, so this is taken from um, the art of swimming, which uh, is one of the, um, where I guess his, his love of reading and exercise came, came together. It, Franklin used this book to help teach him to swim, which was quite unusual um, to do at the time. And um, he experimented with some ways to help him swim faster. So he, um, in his autobiography, he talks of experimenting with swim paddles or fins that he could attach to his feet or his hands, and even uh, trying to um, be pulled across the water by a kite. Now, um, well, uh, kites will become very attached with Franklin later in life when he does this famous kite and sea experiment, but he was using them even at this, this young age, so a kind of proto um, windsurfing. Uh, just a quick aside here, um, if you're interested to find out more about Franklin swimming, um, our Lady Joan Reed or children's author in residence at Benjamin Franklin House, uh, Professor Sarah Pomeroy, is currently working on a book for young adults, um, which is going to be entitled Ben Franklin Swimmer, and it's due to be published by the American Philosophical Society next year, hopefully. So um, do check back on our website and our, our social media if you're interested in finding out more about that. So. Um, after leaving school at 10, um, in addition to really continuing to teach himself things, Benjamin Franklin did continue his education through apprenticeships. So we'll come on to talk about that now. So um, at the age of 10, Franklin had some notions that he would be suited to a life at sea, which um, Josiah was uh, 
was very much against. And um, there's an anecdote in the autobiography where he talks of his father taking him around all the local tradesmen, trying almost window shopping, uh, trying to help Franklin find his trade. So um, after leaving school, uh, he didn't go and become a sailor. He briefly worked for his father and then also uh, very briefly for his cousin Samuel, who was a cutler. Um, but then after that, in 1718, um, so when he was 12 years old, um, Franklin became an apprentice to his older brother James, who um, had just returned from London. He had gone to London to um, really perfect the, his knowledge of the, the printing trade and also to um, obtain the equipment to open his own press. So when he um, joined his brother as an apprentice, he, uh, Benjamin Franklin signed on um, for nine years under that apprenticeship and, he, and for eight of those years he'd be unpaid beyond bed and board. However, um, Benjamin Franklin was always um, ingenious, I think we can say, and so in his autobiography he talks of finding ways to economise, um, particularly thinking about his diet, he even experimented with, with vegetarianism, so he wasn't buying expensive meats, and by doing that he was then able to fuel his book habit, um, which uh, would, would be influential in him going on to um, start writing, which we'll come to talk about in a moment. So. Um, uh, on the left of your screen, you can see an image of the New England Current. So this was a really important, um, influential newspaper which James founded in 1721. In fact, I think this is um, the cover of the first edition. And um, he, after his time in London, he really tried to apply an, an English style of journalism. So that was um, outspoken and, and entertaining as well. And it was a weekly publication and, and, was very, and did very well, was very popular. Now, um, James and, and Ben didn't have the easiest relationship. James was, was, um, has been described as quite a hard, hard taskmaster, and Franklin even uh, um, recounts having received beatings, um, which actually, unfortunately, wasn't, wasn't totally uncommon um, with apprentices. Um, so, because of this slightly um, difficult relationship, um, Ben knew that James wouldn't be very receptive to um, publishing publishing him in his, in his paper. Um, Benjamin, by this point, Benjamin Franklin was really developing an interest, continuing to develop his interest in language and, and starting to write. So, uh, as I said, always ingenious, he came up with a way around this, which was to adopt a pen name. So he adopted this very famous pen name, Silence Do Good, and um, he dropped off the, the articles on the doorstep of the, the printing press. And um, James, not knowing that they were penned by, by Ben, um, published them. Now, the, they were reporting to be letters to the editor written by a, uh, a young widow. And um, they were filled with wit and uh, were very successful. And the newspaper even received some um, proposals of marriage um, in, in response to them. So when Ben did eventually, after 14 of these letters were um, published in the autumn of 1722, um, when Ben finally revealed that it was in fact him, uh, unfortunately it only, only served to fuel the tensions um, be between him and his brother. And that would all start to come to a head later that year when James got in, in really quite a bit of trouble for criticising the local government. Um, then in January um, 1723, the um, New England um, Current was actually banned and um, James had to leave Boston for, for a time and, and eventually would be tried. Um, and at this point, so in February, Ben Franklin's name started appearing on the front of the, um, of the newspaper. And after that, their, their relationship really continued to deteriorate. So this is, I guess, largely what pushed Benjamin Franklin towards choosing to leave Boston um, in September of that same year and look for a job elsewhere. So we're going to see now or talk a bit now about the about the journey he made. So on the left um, of your screen there's a, a map um, uh, which which will help visualize the, the journey I'm about to describe. So um, in order to fund this this departure from Boston um, Benjamin Franklin had to sell a portion of his library. And he left uh, in secret on the 25th of September, um, 1723. And um, the first thing he did was he sailed 300 miles to New York City, which took him three days. Um, but he only stayed there for, he was originally intending to find work in New York, but um, he only ended up staying there for four days. Um, 
because there, there was no, no printing jobs to be found. So he then um, took another trip, uh, another ship to um, Perth Amboy in New Jersey. And from there, he traveled by a combination of walking and also a boat along Delaware and finally arrived in Philadelphia on the 6th of October. And um, he describes this rather humorously in his, um, in his autobiography. He explains how he, he arrived rather disheveled and with only one Dutch dollar and um, some copper pence pieces in his pocket. And I think it's roughly this moment that the, the statue on the, the, the right of your screen is trying to capture. So um, this was, um, was made in 1914 and um, by the artist R. Tate McKenzie. And um, it's currently standing on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where there are many other um, incarnations of Franklin in different guises. So this is the young Franklin arriving in, in Philadelphia. And the University of Pennsylvania is, is just one of the many Philadelphia institutions that um, Benjamin Franklin would later be involved in, in the founding of in, in the years to come. So although he um, didn't have many means upon arrival, he, he soon was able to find em employment with a, with a slightly difficult character, a printer named Samuel Keemer. And he was able to find him lodging um, with an Englishman, a carpenter called John Reed, um, whose daughter Deborah um, Benjamin Franklin would later go on to marry. So just over a year after he arrived um, in, in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin planned to sail to London um, as his brother James had done before him so that he could um, perfect his, his um, printing skills and also obtain the equipment needed to begin his, uh, to, to found his own printing press. Um, so he had, had received, um, he had come into contact with the government of Pennsylvania, Sir William Keith, who was another difficult character, um, who had agreed to sponsor Franklin's trip and, and to even give him letters of recommendation. Unfortunately, he didn't follow through with these promises, but Benjamin Franklin left nonetheless on a um, auspiciously entitled um, ship called the London Hope uh, in November 1724. Um, so although when Benjamin Franklin arrived in, um, in London several, several weeks later, it was not um, in the way that he'd envisioned, um, he was able to, to land on his feet as uh, ingenious as, as ever. Um, so when he arrived in London, see, there we go. So um, the map on the left, that's from 1725, so around this time. Um, so to Franklin arriving in London, it would have been really, um, quite an impression. So a real thriving metropolis, um, uh, really a lot larger and busier than the, the colonial towns that he'd been used to. So um, Franklin would then spend um, 18 months working for two well-established printers in London. Um, the first of those was Samuel Palmer. Uh, he worked in an area called Little Britain, um, which was well known for its printers and its, um, its, uh, its booksellers. Um, and uh, the, the shop that he worked in was actually located in the, the Lady Chapel um, of St. Bartholomew the Great, which still is there in London today. There's a, a historic image of the church on the right of your screen. Uh, and this um, chapel was used, used for commercial purposes. So after working with Palmer, he then went on to work with a man called um, James Watt, who had a larger, um, larger printing press. And he was based um, by Lincoln, Lincolnton Fields, also still there today. And um, he was really well known as, as a literary publisher, um, publishing um, writers such as Alexander Pope, amongst others. Um, now, going back to refer referring back to um, Nick Bunker's Young Benjamin Franklin and the birth of ingenuity, um, I think he Nick, Nick Bunker has an interesting argument about this stage in Franklin's life, which really was very formative, and I think we can argue. Um, so really important seeds for what was to come. Um, and he, he, he argues that in addition to the, the practical skills that Franklin gained from working with these well-established printers, he also gained an understanding of the, uh, the um, economics of printing, uh, which would help him to establish his very successful printing press when he returned to Philadelphia, which we'll go on to speak, to, speak about in a moment. Um, and as well as these, um, this experience with these printers, um, he also came across some um, other important contacts which would influence another strand of Franklin's life later down the line, his, his science. So um, he came across some really key individuals, uh, I say came across, but um, in some circumstances, engineered meetings with um, 
uh, some of the key individuals from the city's really thriving and influential scientific community. So these included um, Sir Hans Sloan, who um, was the successor of um, Sir Isaac Newton as the president of the Royal Society and also founded the British Museum. And another of these characters was Henry Pemberton, who was another collaborator of Sir Isaac Newton. And um, these connections would not only pave the way for Benjamin Franklin's scientific work, um, but they'd also would be helpful when he was going to return to England as a diplomat uh, and indeed live at Craven Street in the 1750s. So after eight, those 18 months in London, Benjamin Franklin returned to Philadelphia. And this is, we're no, nearly at the end of um, where, where we're going to leave his story today. So um, he returned to Philadelphia in 1726. And he, after his experience in London, his um, professional ambition was really, um, had been really stoked and his intellectual um, interest had been stimulated. And so he straight away started doing some really interesting things. So um, in, the, in the following year, in 1727, um, he founded the Junto Club. So um, he, he was perhaps trying to recreate that, um, that very stimulating intellectual atmosphere he'd been able to find in, in London. Um, and so the Junto Club was a, a lively discussion group made up of uh, mostly craftsmen and also surveyors. And it was intended to bring uh, mutual improvement. Um, so I think this, this um, early innovation of Franklin's perhaps reflects his um, belief which he held throughout his life in, in collaboration and also contributing to the public good. Um, so the year after that, in 1728, he took over um, the Pennsylvania Gazette um, and, um, sorry, in 1728 he started his own printing press and then the year after that, in 1729, he took over the Pennsylvania Gazette and this printing press would go on to, to be extremely successful, uh, partly because of the success of, of Franklin's newspaper, which was a weekly publication as the New England Current had been, um, but also because um, Franklin was a, a shrewd businessman and he made sure that he took on diverse commissions, he um, printed um, currency and also lots of smaller commissions too. And um, he did have some luck. The, the econ economy in um, Pennsylvania was growing rapidly at the time. But I think it's also fair to say that um, his work ethic, his, his uh, sharp intelligence and ingenuity were also really key to him building this um, successful business, which would then allow him to actually retire um, at the age of 42, a wealthy man, and then um, give him the time and the means to pursue his scientific interests and his um, political interests and um, have a really important mark in those areas as well. So we're going to leave Franklin's story at this point as he starts along the path to success and influence which would follow. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed hearing about the early years of this great American life and uh, I'm going to do my best now to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much Eleanor for going through Benjamin Franklin's early life. Um, so if anybody has any questions you have two options. You can either uh, write your question in the Q&A section um, which you'll see below on your screen or if you'd like to uh, actually speak directly to Eleanor um, you can also raise your hand and I will call on you. So I think we uh, might have, we already have two questions. Um, so uh, Nahid Hussain has asked, when was he born? I think this was answered already, but maybe you could go over it again. Absolutely. So he was born on the 17th of January 2006, and that was um, in Boston on, on Milk Street. And actually, um, we celebrate this uh, day at the house every year. Um, it's actually also the Benjamin Franklin House birthday because we opened on the 17th of January 2006 on what would have been Franklin's 300th year. Great. Um, and now we have uh, Susie Furnival who'd like to ask a question. So I'm just gonna call on uh, her now. Am I unmuted? Yes. Uh, we've heard a lot about Benjamin Franklin and electricity later in his life, but do you think any of the people that he met in London in that first visit influenced that ongoing interest of his? Thank you so much for your question. Um, yes, definitely. I think um, he was really inspired by those, um, by the, by the um, scientific activity that was going on in London when, when he lived there the first time and those important individuals he met. 
um, there was one particularly important contact that would influence his work in electricity. So I mentioned um, during my presentation that um, Benjamin Franklin went on to found several really important public institutions in, um, in Philadelphia and one of those was the first um, subscription lending library and um, he had a contact in, in London called uh, Peter Collinson uh, who would send him books for the library and they corresponded um, a lot and as well as books Peter Collinson would then send um, some of the scientific equipment that Franklin would begin to um, use in his first electrical experiment so one of these uh, this uh, one of these things was a was a glass rod um, that Franklin could use to create static electricity, and indeed it was his letters to Collinson um, that he later published um, under the title his I can't remember the exact title, but it's his um, observations and experiments into electricity. So I think those. British contacts were really key. Uh, another important one was um, Joseph Priestley, um, so famous British scientist who um, is particularly well known for his experiments into, into air and oxygen. And um, it was, in fact, it was British, it was Joseph Priestley who pointed Benjamin Franklin in the way of, uh, in the direction of 36 Craven Street. Um, but they had a, a very um, fruitful and long um, friendship as well. Um, so the next question that we have is, what do you think was the major contribution he made during this period of his life? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. I think um, I partly chose th this period because it's almost the period where he's he's being set up to have the, the really big influences that he would go on to have later. But already in this period, probably the most important thing was um, his um, influence on um, journalism. So um, his work on the New England um, Current and also with the, the Pennsylvania Gazette. And um, obviously his, his work as a printer was going to dominate the next 20, 20 years or so of his life. Um, so I think um, in terms of influence in this period, um, that's probably where he had the most influence. But all of the experiences he was, ha was having, I think, were laying the groundwork for the even bigger influence he was going to go on to have later in life. Um, so uh, the next question that we have is, Benjamin Franklin had so many interests and accomplishments. Did he ever say or write which was his favorite pursuit? Another excellent question. Um, Benjamin Franklin really was interested in so many things. Um, I'm not sure if he spoke about a favorite pursuit. I do know that he, um, when he was thinking about his um, inventions, he, it, something we haven't spoken about at all um, today is that Franklin was, was a key musician, something, another string to his bow. And um, one of his inventions, um, in fact, that he invented when he was living at 36 Craven Street, the, the glass harmonica, um, which is based on the, the musical glasses where, um, you use water in your finger to create quite an ethereal sound. Um, so he invented that at Craven Street. And he did say that that was um, the invention which had um, brought him the most personal satisfaction. So I don't know if we can um, uh, surmise from that that perhaps music was, was very important to him. Okay, uh, so the next question that we have um, is, what were the main literary influences that inspired Benjamin Franklin's early writing, such as Silence, Do Good Letters? That's an excellent question. So he um, was reading some uh, journalists, um, which Im Im influenced his, his journalistic style. Um, and also he, he, was a, um, he was a great consumer of fiction. Um, he loved Robinson Crusoe. Um, so although that might not have influenced his um, journalism so much, that may have been partly behind um, his, his idea of becoming uh, a seaman. Okay. Uh, another question that we have is, where, were his siblings as famous as he was? Um, no, <laughs> um, but they did do some important things as well. So James, his older brother, um, is, is, is a really important figure and um, his work with the New England Current um, was very important. And although he got in trouble for it, um, you know, it was, a, it was perhaps one of the first more independent newspapers that was challenging 
the government. Um, and we don't know a lot about many of Franklin's siblings. And the sibling who he was closest to is his young, youngest sister, Jane. Um, and there's actually a lovely book um, uh, by Jill Lepore, which um, through Franklin's letters to Jane, they, they corresponded a lot. And she had a very different life to him. She remained in Boston. Um, she um, wasn't terribly literate, but, but, but could read and write. And um, they corresponded frequently. And so um, Jill Lepore uses those, those letters. We do have a lot of the material. Um, we have Franklin papers, his, his letters, his, um, his writings. Um, she uses that material to shine a light on, on, on Jane's life. Um, so I recommend that as well. Okay. Uh, so the next question that we have is from Andrea L. And she says, you briefly mentioned his wife. Please tell us a bit more about his relationship with his wife and any children in this period that, that we know of. Yes, absolutely. So, um, right. So they met, um, Deborah and Franklin met when he first arrived in Philadelphia. As I mentioned, um, he, he was lodging with, with Deborah's parents. Um, so they formed an attachment, but then um, Franklin um, really followed his fortunes and went to London. And over the period when he was in London, sadly, um, Deborah's father died. Um, so she was under some pressure to, um, to, to find, a, find a husband, uh, which she did. Unfortunately, he, um, he, didn't, he, he wasn't um, the nicest of people and he ended up uh, sort of disappearing. Um, so when Franklin returned, they were in a slightly complicated situation, but they ended up getting a, a common law marriage. So that was in 1730. So just after um, I kind of set my, my cut off point. Um, so they married in 1730. And then um, they, um, we don't actually know an awful lot about uh, Deborah Franklin, unfortunately. We have um, the letters to Franklin. We don't have a lot of her other letters. Um, and obviously they um, had spent a lot of time apart. So he was in, they married in 1730 and then he came to um, England to live at Craven Street in 1757. And he was living away um, from Philadelphia for 16 years. That was over an 18 year period. So he did go back for, for two years in, in the middle. Um, but they spent a lot of time apart. And, and during this period, she was actually overseeing the construction of their house in Philadelphia, um, which unfortunately is, is no longer standing, but they do have um, the frame outline of the house and um, there's the Franklin Underground Museum um, below it, which I recommend visiting if you're ever in, in the area. Um, and so she, she was um, really looking after affairs, as it were, um, when, when he was in London. So a lot of their correspondence related to that. Um, in terms of children, so he, Franklin had his elder son, William, um, was, we don't know who his mother was, so that was before his marriage to Deborah, but um, Deborah and Franklin brought him up together and William actually went with Franklin to, um, to London and helped him in his political work. Unfortunately, um, at the end of Franklin's time in London, when he returned to America and um, really became a confirmed patriot and the um one of the founding fathers as we as we remember him today um william chose to stay as a loyalist in england so they um, unfortunately had um had a sort of schism at the end of before the end of franklin's life and, and didn't reconcile now he also had a um a daughter sarah or known as sally and um they 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 were quite close and and then they had a younger son who sadly died um from, from smallpox which is partly why um franklin went on to um support um immunization and so sarah was because he'd had this um falling out with um william um sarah would go on to be his inheritor and she became sarah Bache. so sorry that was rather rambling but i hope that answers your question and I just wanted to mention very quickly that um, Eleanor mentioned the fact that uh, Franklin and his uh, his sister Jane Newcomb they they um, they sent letters to each other. We actually do have a copy of the letter um, at Benjamin Franklin House. Um, it's in our um, seminar room, so I would encourage you once we are reopened um, after the after we reopen for you to come and visit it um, when when you're if you're in London. So. Um, yes, and so the next question that we have, and I think we have time for maybe a. a one or two more questions before we need to wrap this up. But um, the next question we have was, um, he was so young to be taking on his business in the US, did he already have a patron when he set up his um, printing shop, that is? Yes, he, he was really young. Um, so I think he had um, sort of made, made some funds when, when he was in London and then, and then was able to, and he also 
acquired the equipment when he was in London. In fact, they didn't have, um, they had to get the lead type from, from London. They didn't have a, a lead mine in, in the colonies yet. Um, so he had those um, to, to help him. In terms of other patrons, I'm not entirely sure on that, but um, something to look into. Um, and then we have one last question. Um, and it is from Georges, age eight. And he said, what gave him the idea to use a kite for learning how to swim? <laughs> That's a really good question, George. Thank you so much for your question. Um, so Franklin actually writes about this in his autobiography. So um, if you were to go and have a look, you could see, see his description of what happened. So I think if I remember rightly, he had the kite um, at the side of, um, of the lake uh, where he was swimming. There were lots of salt marshes around uh, Boston at the time. And um, he was just observing the wind pulling it and, and decided to, to, to try try out what would happen if he used it when he was swimming. And I think that's that decision to do that is quite reflective of Franklin's um, way of process. He was, he was um, very curious and um, not afraid of trying things out and making mistakes and, um, and then being able to create things out of that. And that's one of the reasons we think he's such a great um, person for, um, children to learn about and um, a role model, really. Okay, well, thank you very much for um, taking the time to speak to us about Benjamin Franklin's early life, Eleanor. Um, as, as I mentioned, we, this is one of our weekly virtual talks that we're doing here at Benjamin Franklin House. Um, so please do tune in next week. Um, next week, it is going to be Phil Davies speaking about uh, the US elections. So I do hope that you tune in. Um, as Eleanor also mentioned, um, we are offering these talks for free, um, but if anybody would be willing to make uh, any kind of donation, um, no matter how little, um, to help us kind of fund these projects that we're working on, that we much appreciate it, and that can be done at uh, www.benjaminfranklinhouse.org. So um, thank you very much for tuning in, and we hope to see you uh, next time. Thank you so much. Bye.